15. Thanks for having me. You know, after spending 10 years researching and writing Caledonian Road, this seems a nice opportunity to pause for 15 minutes and think about how it came about and what that relationship with some of those big Victorians was all about. So many of the people who have written about the book in the last two weeks have used the word Dickensian. And although that was often a word somewhere in my head, I don't know if I've ever sat down for 15 minutes and really worked through what that would mean. He's certainly one of my favourite writers, and he's been there kind of on my shoulder as a sort of whispering advisor through all the years that I was working on this book. I want to take you back a wee bit further first. When I was about seven or maybe eight in primary three, as we call it in the UK, I had a teacher called Mrs Doherty who encouraged us to write something called our news book. So our news books were, um, I suppose, to practice our handwriting, but I took the job slightly seriously. And every morning, I mean, I arrive in class and there'd be 30 kids in our rows and I would start writing my news book. And very quickly, it became clear to Mrs. Doherty and to me that I was appointing myself as a slightly frontline reporter from the living room back home. So my coming and going father and my slightly upsettable mum would be would find themselves fully described in the news book of this uh, eight year old. And the teacher called my mother in and said, I don't know what it is about Andrew, but he seems to sort of have taken the idea of news a bit literally, and he's become a bit of a reporter. So the situation in the Hurley Burley at home is all being fully described in the news book. That was an early showing, I think, of an instinct that I have, um, and that many of us have who are interested in writing novels, to, if you like, marry up observed reality with the work of the imagination, to let creative writing, if you like, borrow or depend to some extent on visible experience. One of the people who gives us courage and permission when it comes to this pursuit is of course Charles Dickens. And he has been on my shoulder much longer than the time that it's taken to write Caledonian Road. He's actually been there for me as a kind of tutor and a friend almost to the open consciousness that I think is required if you're going to write about a lot of characters and a lot of people from different walks of life. I've depended quite a lot on Dickens's journalism um, in, uh, over the course of my writing career, I think. And I made a note here of a bunch of pieces written between 1850 and 1860, where Dickens took on the task of going into the places that he intended to feature in his novels. He wasn't the sort of writer who if he was describing an orphanage, would just kind of dream up an orphanage. There was lots of dream work in his writing, but he would go to an orphanage. He'd talk to the people who worked there. He'd examine the children, talk to them about their backstories. That's the kind of reporter and novelist he was. He invented a kind of reported fiction, in my view. This list here includes things like a walk, a walk in a workhouse from 1850, going out with detectives, that same year, going to a paper mill later in the year, the next day covering the railway strikes of 1851, roaming around Spitalfields endlessly, picking up character, detail. Going on duty with Inspector Field was one of his pieces from 1851. Assistant Commissioner of Police uh, Field, his main responsibility was looking after the British Museum at night. So he'd go in with a, you know, the equivalent of a torch, a lamplight you know, and would go through uh, the rooms, looking at the Elgin marbles, going in among the Roman sculptures into the Chinese department to make sure everything was safe and secure. But on this particular visit from Dickens, he also took him into St. Giles's church, where there were huddles of unaccommodated men and women, that's to say homeless people in the basement of the church. And Dickens examined their lives, their clothes, their eating habits, their needs and brought it all back to his fiction. I have to say that when I was writing Caledonian Road, I had this notion all the time of Our Mutual Friend, published in 1864. So um, just a few years after he stopped writing these big 
reported pieces and he harvested all that detail in that tremendous novel. It's his last completed novel, Our Mutual Friend, and it's a magnificent, magical piece of human imagining. What you find in that novel is that the River Thames becomes not just a metaphorical thoroughfare that connects up all these different people in the novel, hordes of characters, but it's also more than metaphorical. It's like a kind of physical um, solution in which these people's dream life and their working life is bathed. I'll never forget coming across that novel for the first time, I was quite young, and thinking, what would it be like if a modern novel had a thoroughfare like the River Thames, touching on people, not only from different walks of life, but people who we seldom see described in novels, people from the high life of the aristocracy, right down to street gangs. What about Russian oligarchs? What about people who turn up in the Old Bailey? What about the life of a newspaper? What about the life of a sweatshop where Bangladeshi women are passing garments back and forward? I discovered whilst researching um, Caledonian Road that some of the highest numbers of deaths um, from COVID in this country were among those Bangladeshi women who were working in unsafe conditions in um, unsafe factories in the Midlands. And I went there using the Dickens example, going into it as he went into workhouses and trying to interview everyone, try to get a sense of exactly what the conditions were and what the reality was for these people who were working there. Why Caledonian Road though? I have to say that Dickens again was there, a kind of tutelary shadow um, in the background. I lived in King's Cross when I first came to London age 21, I came from Glasgow on the overnight bus, which used to park itself at King's Cross. And I came out to this bustling bit of London, which I later learned hadn't changed in its appearance really since the 1940s. Still cobbled streets behind the station in those days. The great gas holders, which have since moved up the canal and are now full of uh, million, I mean, seven million pounds in some cases, penthouse flats. Um, but in those days, it was cobbled streets, it was gasometers, it was the two Victorian railway stations of St Pancras and King's Cross, the Regent's Canal flowing through, and up the side of it, that great North London street, Caledonian Road. What I discovered about Caledonian Road from living there was that it was one of the most multifaceted streets in Britain. On the one side of the road, you had those huge wedding cakey houses in places like Thornhill Square, posh houses worth millions, getting more valuable all the time through the 1990s and through the noughties. This explosion of sort of property value that was happening, which I hadn't quite seen in a novel yet. And on the other side of Caledonian Road, there was social housing and there were people often, uh, migrant communities coming into London, new languages, new voices, new cultures into the street all the time. When I looked at the Victorian poverty maps for Caledonian Road from the 1890s, um, not far distant from when um, our friend Charles Dickens was writing Our Mutual Friend 25 years later, what we find is a colour coding of the social and economic conditions of all the people living in the streets around King's Cross. And here's the news. When I laid that colour map over the map of King's Cross, during the period that I've been writing about it, it's exactly the same. The same squares are still full of wealthy people. The same places that were used to be full of rented accommodation and um, you know, workhouses, goods yards, um, and people living in dwelling rooms and so on uh, in conditions of poverty, it's still the same right around Pentonville Prison. And all those streets today, you can, you can look at them and see that despite, you know, hundreds of years of change, of technological development, of the NHS, of living in a welfare state, still the inequalities are the same. And that seems to me a provocation for a novelist. It certainly did when I was working on Caledonian Road. But here was an opportunity to try and explain that and to show that to dramatise it, to show 60 characters in constant motion, all of whom seem to be touched somehow by Caledonian Road. They seem to pass up it, pass through it, see it every day, buy food there, 
go from that station. And we think they're all living lives apart, but slowly in the drama of the novel, there's an accumulating sense of, all, of them all coming together. That they really are under the same weather, breathing the same air. For all their differences, they are in the world at the same time. They are in London at the same time. They are London. And I wanted the novel to carry that. The reception to this novel has overwhelmed me because people are seeing the drama and seeing the connection as if they'd been waiting for somebody to describe contemporary London back to them. But I have to tell you that the main connection to Dickens is the endless sense of the research that had to be done, you know, months and months in the Old Bailey, going in search of oligarchs, ending up in nightclubs with these guys running up huge bills, pouring expensive wine onto the carpet, you know, hanging out at the polo trials at Windsor, going out with street gangs. There was a lot of costume changes involved, changes involved for me whilst researching this book. And the thing that you come away with in the end is a sense that reality and imagination have a lot to do with each other in the end. As we've always sus suspected, great films depend on it. Um, great television uh, serials depend on it. And for this long time since, the big social novel depends on it, that the connections are real, that this, a comedy of manners, and it is a comedy in the end, because the, the, the scenes one after the other try to reveal the essential comic nature at the heart of not only communities and families, but individuals. People are funny, even in adversity. That was one of the things that kept me going, certainly. But as well as that, there's a relationship between comedy and morality. And if we can get the novel to be alive to that, alive to the notion that we don't live single lives, discreetly, separately, unrelatedly to each other. We might have our secret histories, our hinterlands, our exclusive truths, we feel, that are only true about us individually or as groups. But in the end, we are breathing the same air. And the novel is a great communality. That's what I wanted for this book. And that's what I got from my friend Charles Dickens. Thanks for listening.